The first up, please put your hands together for our friend Ulrich. It's great to see you again. Now, this is slightly different from yesterday's talk, where you did about diversity and how it's different. What are we talking about today? Today, we are discussing a very simple question. The yes. digital revolution, what is next? Excellent. A and my guest is born, he was born in Bavaria. Oh. Then he moved to the US, he graduated from Harvard, got his PhD at MIT, founded several startups, became a business angel, an investor, is now a managing partner for uh, Union Square Ventures in New York. This, as you mentioned, won a billion dollar exit every year with this uh, VC company. And he's a thinker, he's a writer, he's written or is still writing a book, a very interesting book, uh, World After Capital. Nice. And we will get discuss some of these uh, arguments on stage. Please welcome Albert Wenger. Anything to drink? Water? Yes. Red Bull over there? You mentioned that you're... I, I think I'm thoroughly caffeinated. I, I arrived this morning from New York, so I think I may have had one coffee too many. If I speak too fast, slow me down. Okay, and the uh, Red Bull manager was sitting next to you, I heard. Uh, from the uh, Red Bull uh, soccer team in New York, which okay. is New York's current soccer That's team. That's the FC Bayern of New York. Uh, kind of. Aspiring. 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 Bayern of okay. New York. Okay, we won't talk about soccer, but it's a very simple question. What is next in the digital revolution? Yeah, so as a VC, when I get this question, um, people generally want to hear something like, oh, it's robotics or AI or um, the latest crypto blockchain things. Um, and that's all interesting. Uh, but the question that's more interesting to me about what's next is sort of what's next for society. So um, technology lets us do new things, but then the question is what new things do we really want to do? And uh, what is next for society? What, what's, what's the shift we see now in society? We see a te shift in technology and a shift in business models. What, what does it make to the society? So I think we are in the middle of a shift that's as profound as when we went from the agrarian age to the industrial age. Um, and when we go from one age to another age, what changes is the binding constraint. So in the agrarian age, what mattered was how much land did you have, land on which you could grow food. And then in the industrial age, what mattered was how much capital could you accumulate. Um, I don't mean financial capital, I mean physical capital, factories, buildings, Machines. transportation, infrastructure, mm -hmm. exactly. And I think we're in the middle of a massive shift away from where capital is the binding constraint to where attention is the binding constraint. So attention is fundamentally scarce. Um, we all have 24 hours in the day. Yesterday is gone. So whatever you paid attention to yesterday or whatever you paid attention to in the last hour, you can't go back and fix that. So you either paid attention to something that's important and meaningful or you didn't. And so I think that is the fundamental defining scarcity of the digital age and one we are not dealing with very well at the moment. That's interesting because you're an investor, you're dealing with capital, with financial capital, and you argue that, that there's plenty of capital and that's not the problem anymore. There's plenty of both physical capital, so we can make all the stuff we ever want to make. Yeah. Um, if you want to convince yourself of that, just look at a place like China, where they're you know, building entire high-rise buildings and train stations literally in days. Um, so we have the capacity to, um, we have enough capital to meet everybody's basic needs. Um, what we don't have enough is enough attention on important things. So that's why my book is called World After Capital, because capital is kind of the thing we're done with. And when it comes to financial capital, um, all around the world, interest rates are really, really low. Um, that's a good sign that there's a lot of financial capital around. And following the 2008 financial crisis, the central banks in all the developed countries created a lot of additional financial capital. So that's not you know, what we're hung up on. In fact, if you think about 
financing of startups, there are now many, many, many billion dollar funds. And then there's the SoftBank Vision Fund, which is a single fund that's a hundred billion dollar fund. So people are actually able to raise a lot of capital for a lot of really interesting ideas. Yeah. World after capital, does that also mean world after capitalism? And that we have to me move to a different model for our economy and also for our society? So I think capitalism is great. <laughs> um, billion, just, dollar, billion dollar exit every year. <laughs> it just can't solve all problems. Um, and because it's great, it's actually solved a lot of problems. And so in a way, the problems, the most challenging problems that remain, such as the problem of allocating attention, is actually not very well solved by capitalism. So capitalism works well when there are markets. Markets work well when there are prices. And um, you can't have prices for some of the most important things. So what's an example of that? At the personal level, um, what's the price for you finding your purpose in life? There's no price attached to that. Um, and as a result, if the allocation of your attention is governed by prices, you will pay attention to things like, what's the latest car? What should I be spending money on? Or what should I do to make more money? So it's very easy to have the price mechanism hog a lot of our attention. Um, that works in other ways as well. If you think about companies like Facebook or Twitter, um, you know, the way they become more valuable in the market is by hogging more of people's attention. And so their interest isn't in saying, go off and meet a friend or go read a book. Their interest is in like, oh, let me show you another cat picture mm -hmm. um, because that makes them more valuable. So um, the price mechanism is not great for allocating individual attention. And it's also not good for allocating collective attention. So if you think about something like climate change, it's a species level threat for humanity. Um, and relative to the size of the threat, not nearly enough attention is being paid on how to fix it. Why? Because there really aren't any prices. There's no, it's very hard to deal with what's, how could you use a price to allocate attention to climate change? I'll give you another example. Um, Asteroid strikes, so every f million years-ish, give or change, some, something big comes out of space and hits the Earth. Um, and um, we know that's going to happen again. Um, but if you allocate attention to this problem on the basis of prices, there is no price because it's an event that happens once in a million years. So that you can't have a market-based solution for that. And so a lot of what I'm writing about in the book is, well, if you can't have a market-based solution, what are other solutions you could have that would let people pay attention to things that are individually important and collectively important. Yeah. And what are the solutions? <laughs> <laughs> so in the book, I talk about three freedoms. I talk about economic freedom, informational freedom, and psychological freedom. Economic freedom is some form of universal basic income. So it's the idea that everybody gets some amount of money every week, every month, um, so that they can take care of their basic needs. Mm -hmm. Because the robots are stealing all our jobs. No, so that the robots can steal all of our jobs, right? I mean, we have this weird relationship to automation at the moment because we've defined ourselves for years in the industrial age through our jobs. Now, all of a sudden, we're afraid that those jobs might be taken over by a machine when that's the exact thing that we want. If we hadn't automated agriculture, none of us would be in this room right now. We'd be in the fields breaking our backs just to feed mm -hmm. ourselves. So if you look at agriculture, agriculture at one point took up basically 80 plus percent of all human attention. Today, it's like four or five percent, mm -hmm. if that. Um, and that's because we've largely automated agriculture. And we want to do the same thing for many, many, many things that we currently use humans. Like, a lot of jobs, like at the back end of an insurance company, is literally shuffling papers around. You know, mm -hmm. If you can get a machine to do that, I think that's a great thing. So we just need to set ourselves up uh -huh. to be happy for a machine to do it as opposed to a human. So the universal basic income is not uh, the answer to the technical, uh, technological revolution, but it's like the precondition that we can embrace robotics yes. and AI and all this yes. stuff. We want to be able to embrace automation, not fight it. Um, okay. And then the second freedom I talk about in the book is what I call informational freedom. So informational freedom has to do with this fact that everybody in the audience here, in their pocket, has a supercomputer. Um, it's more compute power than existed in all the world if you go back just a few decades. Um, in your pocket, and it's connected to everybody in the world. But there's this weird thing, which is 
you've paid for the supercomputer, you pay for the data plan, you pay for the power to charge it, and yet once you hit the icon of an app, let's say Facebook or uh, Google, that computer works entirely for the maker of that app. It doesn't work for you, which is a very, very strange situation, and I think one we badly need to fix. Um, so informational freedom, I talk a lot about how do we get computation back into the hands of the end user and empower end user computation, as opposed to having all the computation and information pile up in just a few very large corporations. Mm -hmm. And then the and, and the answer to that is how, how will oh, you do the that? answer to that is I mean some pe people say break up do Google break up uh, Facebook and whatever yeah I think that's an industrial age answer um, if you look at antitrust uh, antitrust laws come from the industrial age um, I think we need new laws that f are fit for the digital age and the one that I'm proposing is that basically all end user applications need to have APIs just like. The operating system has an API, databases have APIs, et cetera. End user applications like Facebook should have APIs as well. Mm -hmm. um, and what that would make possible is for you and, and me and anybody in the audience to have fully progr programmable applications. So if I don't like the way my interaction works with Facebook, I can get software from a third party, probably not something I write myself, but somebody else has written, that mediates my interaction with um, Facebook. So that example. I can use the whole data pool of Google or Facebook? Well, so that I can use the full power of my computer to mediate my interactions. So what do I mean by that? If, if I want to send something to a friend, the computer should help me decide whether to send that via Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook. The computer should keep track for me of what I've sent to which friend. Um, if friends are posting things, you know, if I want to resort my timeline, I should be able to resort my timeline, and my computer should be able to do that for me. I shouldn't be forced into whatever Facebook's decided is the best and only user experience mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, and you also argue that privacy is more or less a bad concept. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the argument I'm making is that I think we've used privacy as a way to accomplish a more important goal, and that's the goal of individual freedom. Um, and I think that we should care more about how do we make people free um, in an age where a lot of the information may wind up online. Um, you know, not a day goes by when there isn't a big data breach, and there's something fundamental about information that makes it nearly impossible to bottle it up. And so, I think we need to figure out how can we live freely in a world where people might know a lot of things about you. Um, and I think that's more important than trying to protect the data. The German wo word Datenschutz kind of has it wrong in its inception because it's like it's protecting the data. Mm -hmm. But we really care about protecting people, not protecting data. So I think we kind of have it a little bit backwards when we think about privacy. Yeah, and the third freedom? The third freedom I call psychological freedom. And that's a really crucial one and one we can all work on individually. That's basically our bodies are maladapted for a world with sugar. So that's why a lot of people are obese because you crave sugar. And our brains, they crave these little information hits. So that's why you keep refreshing your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed or Instagram or whatever your poison of choice. Um, it's because your brain is so excited every time there's a little something. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our brains evolved in a world where when you saw a squirrel, there was an actual squirrel. And now I can show you an infinity of squirrel pictures, very cute squirrel mm -hmm. pictures. So, <laughs> but that's a problem. And, and if we don't work on it, you know, then we are kind of slaves to this information. Um, and I think, you know, everybody has to find some kind of practice for themselves, whether that's like a mindfulness practice, meditation, breathing, whatever it is. And then we can use technology to help ourselves too. Like your phone has an off button and you just have to learn how to use that or it has a D&D &D <laughs> setting. You have to learn how to use that. Who's using <coughs> the off button of your phone? Oh, not so many. <laughs> you have to work yes. on that. Practice, <laughs> practice. It takes practice to find the off button and then hold it down long enough for the phone to actually turn off. He can explain it where it is. <laughs> this phone is off right now. I was using it just as a prop. <laughs> okay. Um, so you are looking for an answer uh, for a new society or new society model. On the other hand, we see now a move backwards, like we see rise of populism, we see Donald Trump, 
and he's not promoting the new technology, but the old technology is promoting steel coal. and coal and this stuff. Uh, do you see a backlash against the digital revolution right now? Yeah, I, I think there's a backlash that's in full swing, and I think the backlash is, in a way, well-deserved because a lot of us who work in technology, I think we were plowing ahead and building all this stuff without really giving much thought to providing a vision of where it could all go. So we had a vacuum, a vision vacuum that was sort of like a, well, we don't know where this is going to go, but we're plowing ahead. And a lot of people felt increasingly left behind. Uh, and I think they had grievances. And they didn't see how those grievances were going to get addressed. There's a really interesting parallel between the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, and where we are today. So back then, people were moving en masse from the countryside into the city. And for the first time, they were exposed to totally different living conditions, uh, whole new sets of ideas. Um, the city was a lot more free than the village, which was very rigid. We have some of the same happening today, where people online are being exposed to whole new ideas, some of which they don't like, some of which they're not comfortable with. Um, and so it behooves us, everybody who's in tech, everybody who's an entrepreneur in tech, who uh, is a politician, it behooves us to come up with a vision of what can be done, like an optimistic, positive vision. Because if we don't do that, then everybody who is scared, everybody who's feeling uncomfortable, everybody who's worried about the future, they're going to be going to the people who say, look, I've got the answer. The answer is to go back to the past. And that's what you get with Brexit and what you get with Trump. Is it's not a vision of the future. It's, it's, it's a go back to some imagined glorious past. Yeah. If you discuss, if you discuss this with you know, your colleagues, with other investors, with people from the startup system, Uh, is, there an, is there an understanding that you have to speak up? They're stealing us some time. They start at the clock too early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think everybody who is paying attention to what's happening in the world understands that we need something new. Yeah. And are you frightened about Trump and what's going to happen in the next two years, three years? Look, I'm an optimist. It's, you can't be a VC without being an optimist. Um, but. I'm an optimist about where we are going to get eventually. I am somewhat pessimistic about how we're going to get there. Okay. Thank you very much, Albert Wenger, for sharing these uh, um, ideas with us. And if you want to read more about it, go to the internet, uh, worldaftercapital.org. There you can read the book. He's still working on that, so it's work in progress. And this was work in progress as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you.